Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. This is Andrei Shchetnikov with you, and our video today will be dedicated to concepts such as capacitance and potential. And we will start it with a thought experiment. Here on my table I have two metallic bodies on stands. And imagine that one of them is charged, while the other is not yet. However, this is not very important. Then I take and connect these two bodies with a wire. And part of the charge from the charged body flows to the one that was not charged. And now the same charge is distributed across the two bodies. Moreover, since the bodies are different, probably the charges are different too. And although I cannot yet say how electrical capacitance is measured, I can start introducing the concept of capacitance by saying, well, where there is more charge in this situation, the capacitance is greater. And this is similar to how water levels equalize in communicating vessels and in a more general form. Let there be several metallic or generally conductive bodies connected by a common conductive bus. Then, when an electric charge is applied to them, it will somehow distribute itself evenly across all these bodies. Let's also assume that these bodies are far enough apart from each other so that their mutual influence through induction is weak. And then we can say that the distribution of charge across these bodies is determined by their capacitances. So the charges are proportional to these capacitances. And the charges of any two bodies differ by the same factor as their capacitances differ. And of course, even here, we could take the capacitance of some body. For example, a metal sphere with a radius of one meter as the unit of capacitance and express all other capacitances in terms of it. But for now, there's little benefit in this because we still don't know how the capacitances relate to each other, even for the simplest bodies, the simplest spheres. Do they relate as the radii or as the squares of the radii, that is the areas, or as the cubes of the radii, that is the volumes? And we don't know this because we haven't yet answered the question, what exactly equalizes when we connect two charged bodies with a conductor like this? Well, in communicating vessels, their levels equalized. Or you could say the pressures at the two ends of the connecting tube equalized. And what here acts as the level or such pressure? And to answer this question, what? we need to introduce the concept we say, of electric unisse potential. And to proceed further, I need to introduce the concept of a test charge. I will do it like this. Let's imagine, for example, that this large sphere is already positively charged and that this tiny sphere on a stick is also positively charged and the charge on it is so small that I can neglect the effects of electrostatic induction. When I bring this small sphere close to the large sphere, the charges on the large sphere feel it very weakly and do not redistribute across the surface. But of course, the small sphere does feel the force exerted on it by the charges located on the large sphere. And when I move the small sphere from one point in space to another, I perform work, either positive or negative. But since the small sphere is repelled by the large sphere, when I bring it close to the large sphere, the work done is positive. And when I move it in the opposite direction, the work I do is negative. And now a few ideas that I will outline briefly. And here is the first idea. Let there be some charged bodies in space, and we carry a test charge along a closed path. At the same time, the total mechanical work done over the entire cycle will be zero. And this can be imagined as if we were climbing up a hill on some sections of the trajectory and descending on others, ultimately ending up at the same level from which we started. From this, the second idea immediately follows. Let's divide the closed trajectory into two parts. 
if the work on one of them is equal to a, then on the second part it will be equal to minus a, so that their sum is zero. Now let's reverse the direction of movement on the second part, and then the work on it will also be equal to a, just like on the first part. Therefore, when moving a test charge from one point in space to another, the work does not depend on the trajectory along which this movement occurs. Now we need to take the next step and say our test charge itself can be larger or smaller. And then the work, E, of moving it from one point in space to another will be proportionally larger or smaller. Therefore, it is natural to consider the ratio of this work to the magnitude of the test charge. A divided by Q. In the SI system, work is measured in joules, charge in coulombs, and the corresponding quantity we have just introduced will be measured in joules per coulomb. But this quantity has a special name, one volt. This is uh, exactly where volts come into play. Now I return to our diagram, where the test charge Q is moved from point one to point two. And in doing so, work A is performed. I say that the ratio of the work done to the magnitude of the test charge is called the potential difference between point two and point one. Why do we talk about potential difference here? Because potential, and here we were talking about work, yes, it is essentially the potential energy per unit charge. And potential energy, as we remember, and we have a special video about this, can be measured from any level. Just like in mechanics, we can take the level of the table as the zero reference level, or we can take it higher. Conversely, we can measure it lower from the floor or from the ground. It doesn't matter. What matters is that no matter from which initial level we start measuring, the difference between two levels will remain the same. And with potentials in electrostatics, things are exactly the same. And now, guided by these ideas, we can find the potential of a charged sphere and the capacitance of this sphere. But for this, we need to choose a zero potential level. And in physics, it is usually chosen far enough from the charged body. A mathematician would say at infinity. So, let the metallic sphere carry a charge Q and at a distance, R from its center, there is a test charge Q. According to Coulomb's law, a force K acts on the test charge, and Q large, Q small divided by o R squared. Now we need to consider the work done by an external force required to move the test charge to the point where it is now from an infinite distance, or equivalently, the work that the Coulomb force would do, moving the charge from this point to infinity. This work is equal to the integral of the Coulomb force from R to infinity. As u large, q small is factored out of the integral sign, and you need to take the integral of 1 over R squared with respect to doctor within these limits, which equals 1 over R. The potential. At the point where the test charge is located is this work, divided by the magnitude of the test charge, and it equals k. And to find the potential of the charged sphere itself, you need to substitute the radius of the sphere R, capital R, in the denominator instead of R, small r. And it equals U large divided by R, capital R. Doctor, we have calculated the potential of a charged sphere, and now we will calculate the capacitance of the sphere. And for this, let's return to our initial ideas regarding capacitance. Here we have two bodies as they were already positioned, and they are both connected to a source. And I increase the voltage on the source. Well, or in other words, I increase the potential of these bodies. The higher the voltage here, the more volts, the greater the charge on each of these bodies. 
but the charges on the bodies are different. Where the capacitance is greater, the charge is also greater. And therefore, it is natural to introduce such a definition of capacitance, the charge acquired by a body, at a given potential, is proportional to the capacitance of that body. The charge is equal to the product of capacitance, opacance, and voltage. And now I've started saying voltage instead of potential. For us, they are essentially synonyms. I don't want to delve into the nuances of word usage. Let's look further at this formula. We see that capacitance can be expressed as charge divided by voltage. The unit of charge in the SI system is the coulomb, and the unit of voltage is the volt. Accordingly, capacitance is measured in coulombs per volt. And this unit has its own name, the farad. It is named in honor of Michael Faraday. And now we return to our formula for the potential of a charged sphere. From this, we find the capacitance of the sphere. We need to divide the charge by the potential u sex. And we get the radius of the sphere r divided by the coefficient k. But the capacitance is proportional to the radius of the sphere. In the advanced version, instead of 1 over k, we write 4 pi epsilon naught r. This is the formula for the capacitance of a sphere. And perhaps I will rewrite this formula in the following form. The capacitance of the sphere expressed in farads is equal to 1.11 times 10 to the minus 10th multiplied by the radius of this sphere in meters. Well, specifically for this sphere, the radius is 6 centimeters. And therefore, its capacitance is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 12th farads, which is 6.6 .6 picofarads. But let's take a larger sphere uh, the size of the Earth. Then its radius will be 6. 4 times 10 to the 6th meters. Substituting into this formula, we find that the capacitance of a conducting sphere, the size of the Earth, is only 700 microfarads. And now using the formula Q equals Cu, knowing the capacitance of this sphere, I will also know the charge to which it is charged from a 30 kilovolt source. This charge is equal to 2 times 10 to the minus 8th uh, coulombs. But, actually, a more interesting question is what energy is currently stored in this sphere. And that will be the topic of one of the on future videos. <laughs>